Hey there everyone, I'm Nick Ravellis, the Geisel Director of Education and Outreach, but you can call me Dr. Nick. Our final opera of the 2013 season is Aida by Giuseppe Verdi. The opera is a story set in ancient Egypt about the love between Radames, an Egyptian general, and an Ethiopian slave, Aida. This is a love that has to remain secret because they come from two completely different warring cultures. She's been taken prisoner in the long war between Egypt and Ethiopia, and now is the servant of the Egyptian princess, Amneris. The story is called a love triangle because Amneris is also in love with Radames. That is, two women are in love with the same man, but Radames only has eyes for Aida, and that, of course, is the problem. When Radames returns from battle triumphant and with a large group of Ethiopian prisoners, Aida is shocked to recognize her father, Amonazro, the king of Ethiopia, in their presence. Amonazro tells his daughter to keep his identity a secret. There are lots of secrets in this opera. And they will meet later because he has a special request for her. Knowing that she and Radames are in love, her father demands that she finds out the battle plan for Egypt's next military maneuver. She doesn't want to betray Radames, but her father pressures her so much until she agrees. In a weak moment, Radames reveals the plan, and Amneris, hiding nearby, has heard everything. She turns him over to the high priest for judgment, and Radames is condemned to die. This is the kind of tragic story that Verdi loved to tell through music. A story that combines romance, intrigue, and politics with a big dollop of ancient history attached. The opera Aida was commissioned in 1871 by the Khedive of Egypt, who had an opera house in the capital city of Cairo. It was one of the few Verdi operas that premiered outside of Europe and was presented in Italy a few months after those Egyptian performances. But what better opera to write for Egypt than one based on that country's own history? Even though the story is fictitious, it calls for a realistic set and costumes that portray the land of the pharaohs, the pyramids, the sphinx, the valley of the kings, and all of the things that we conjure up in our imaginations as coming from that exotic period. It's important to remember that at this time, all of the arts, including opera, were influenced by things that were considered exotic, and a style called exoticism was very popular with audiences. They loved to come to operas and plays set in distant countries and about ancient cultures. This was also a period when rare and unusual artifacts began to make their way into Europe from far-flung places like China, Japan, Indonesia, Micronesia, the Arab countries and Africa. Artists like the Frenchman Paul Gauguin brought paintings back from his travels through the South Seas and his stay in Tahiti. Eugène Delacroix traveled to North Africa to bring back images of life in Muslim countries. Composers created operas like Lakme, about a Hindu princess who falls in love with an Englishman. The Pearl Fishers, about a love triangle in a fishing village in Ceylon. All these things were extremely popular in Europe at the time. Verdi had resisted writing any operas about exotic locales until very late in his career, and Aida is really the only example of exoticism out of all 30 of his operas. But what an example it is. It's a big opera with a huge chorus, lots of soloists, and a large orchestra accompanying it all. The voices must be huge, too, in order to carry over all that sound in a large theater, and all of them, all of them appear in one scene, what we call the triumphal scene, when the Egyptian general Radames returns from his campaign in Ethiopia, having been victorious over his enemies. At large outdoor arenas in Italy and other countries, opera companies bring in elephants, horses, even giraffes during the parade of Ethiopian treasures. It can be quite stunning. It can also be quite messy, which is why we don't do it here. But our production will be quite spectacular in its own right, designed by the famous British fashion designer Zandra Rhodes, with sets and costumes so colorful and brilliant that you'll forget you're in a theater in San Diego, and you'll imagine that you're in that exotic time and place that Verdi has so wonderfully created for us. 
The story of Aida is certainly exotic, and portions of the music of the opera are exotic as well. The music really does take us to a time and place far, far removed from our own, 3,000, 4,000 years ago in ancient Egypt. In fact, the first music we hear, the prelude to the opera, played by the orchestra alone, always makes me feel like Verdi is setting me up to take a journey in time. It's played by the highest members of the string family, the violins, and played very, very quietly. It, it's like we're invited to peer through a telescope and we see through a distant mist that begins to clear all those ancient monuments and the pyramids and the sphinx, all from ancient Egyptian culture. There are other examples of exoticism in the music, especially this section, which introduces the second scene. The place is the Temple of Vulcan inside the ancient city of Memphis, where Radames is about to be raised up to the rank of general. We hear the female chorus and a priestess singing offstage to the accompaniment of a harp. This music really conjures up a place we've never been, that perhaps we've never even dreamed of. There are other moments of exotic type music, like this little portion of the ballet during the triumphal scene. And speaking of the triumphal scene, you've probably heard this march that is at the center of this spectacular scene and the music which is played by herald trumpets. These aren't regular trumpets that you would normally see in a symphony orchestra. They're trumpets that were built for being played outdoors to announce the arrival of royalty or some other important person. They make a big, bright sound, and playing this tune, they really capture the attention of the audience. The use of those herald trumpets also makes us feel as if we're in an ancient time and place because these instruments are among the earliest instruments ever invented. They were used in religious and military services by the Greeks and Romans, and two herald trumpets were even found in King Tut's tomb in Egypt. So for Verdi to use them in an opera about Egypt made perfect sense. But the most important music in Verdi's Aida is the music he wrote for the voices. Verdi had a way of instilling a great sense of drama and urgency in the music he wrote for these wonderful characters, Radames, Aida, Amonazro, and Amneris. 
Let's take an example from the music for Radames, the aria that he sings at the very beginning of the opera. This is one of the most difficult arias written for the tenor, a strong, bright male voice, because the singer has to perform it in the first five minutes of the opera. That means you have to be able to sing it cold, with practically no warm-up at all. That's one tough assignment. In this aria, Radames speaks about his forbidden love for the Ethiopian Aida, calling her heavenly. In order to match that text, Verdi gives Radames a melody that constantly flows upwards towards the sky. In other words, heavenly. Virtually every phrase in the aria goes up, and very rarely does it come down. Listen. The piano doesn't really do this music justice. You really have to hear a wonderful Italian tenor sing this aria about the heavenly Aida. It's like the perfect hymn to the woman who inspires it. Verdi's Aida is one of the greatest operas ever written. Many people who have come to love opera started out by seeing a performance of this work and that the memory of it always remained with them. That's what I hope for you as you come to see it here at San Diego Opera. I'm Nick Ravellis, and I'll see you at the opera.